right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and if you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms here around the world at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And May is a particularly special month for us. In addition to our slew of programs all month long, we just wrapped up last weekend our Global Biodiversity Festival, which is not only our biggest event ever, but the biggest conservation event of all time, to my knowledge, with over 150 broadcasts over 72 straight hours featuring conservation stories from over 50 countries in every single continent on this planet. So if you want to check that out, check out the website. We're also slowly but surely releasing all our programs, individual programs, onto our YouTube channel at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Similarly during May, and a lot of our teachers joining us live and on YouTube are already a part of this, but do check out our Backyard Bio Global Nature Campaign. So we are in the final home stretch of this, but we are encouraging people, and especially kids, to get out, exploring the natural world near them, sharing photos of all they discover. My intention is, is that anywhere you are on this planet, spend just 10 minutes looking and listening, and you will find at least 10 species close to home. We're trying to acknowledge that and highlight that and encourage mindful observations of the natural world. So get out, check out backyardbio.net. For today's program, we have a ton of interest because it is a topic that we curiously haven't covered near as much as we ought to have. And so today we are joined by Matthias Breiter, and he is going to talk to us about his amazing career in pursuit of wild bears. Pretty much no one on this planet has spent more time in the company of these amazing apex predators than Matthias. His work has been featured in publications all over the world. He was nominated for an Emmy, and he is a truly world-class photographer. So I'm really excited to dive in with his presentation today learn a lot, see some fantastic images, and get excited about one of my favorite kinds of creatures on this planet. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Matthias, and take us away. Uh, you're welcome, Jesse, and thanks everyone for listening in. Uh, if you detect an accent, uh, my kids always tell me that I have a strong one. Uh, I actually didn't grow up in North America. I didn't grow up in polar bear country. I grew up in Germany. And we, I was lucky, I grew up at the forest edge and I spent my entire childhood roaming the woods, uh, finding amphibians that I could put in my aquarium and I was raising uh, exotic birds and breeding them. So that was my, my wildlife when I was a kid. But it led to me studying biology in Germany. And uh, after finishing my undergraduate there, I was given, or well, we had the honor to receive a scholarship for a university of Massachusetts. And within uh, six months of being in North America, uh, I was allowed to go to Glacier National Park to study wildlife. And initially, this was for studying elk, a wintering behavior of elk. But this then turned into a study of uh, wolves preying on elk. And then it ended up being a study on grizzlies uh, scavenging wolf kills. And I got stuck with the bears. And the question then always is, why bears? Well, my interest was always to observe behavior. And behavior in carnivores generally is more interesting than in herbivores because they have to be quite flexible in their behavior. They often have social behavior just to get their food. But carnivores also, for observing them, have a problem. They often lead a very secretive life. They don't want to be seen by the wildlife they're hunting. And uh, bears are, are different for one reason. They often uh, eat vegetable matter, so they're not quite as secretive. Uh, so they were all visible, and then you could see behavior. And so I spent several years in Montana. But then I moved up to Alaska for basically the reason that uh, even in Montana, uh, the, the bears were often hidden in vegetation. You knew they were there. You could see the bushes move. You just couldn't see the bear. And so I moved to interior Alaska <clears throat> in the early 1990s and studied grizzlies there in Denali National Park. Uh, uh, a lot of it is high, high alpine, very low vegetation. And if you look at this, this is a fall shot. Uh, these these bears, they're just clearly visible even from miles away. And even though this area looks quite barren, it is full of berries. And these bears, mostly in the fall, they gorge themselves on berries. This on the right side is the same bear that you saw before in the scenic shot. And he's just eating soap berries. The soap berries are the ones on the left, and they will spend uh, all day long just eating berries, hardly ever getting their, their head up. So for photography, it's actually quite tricky 
because you only see this bear munching away on berry and it doesn't do anything else. And overall, because the food sources for these grizzlies are kind of spread out, uh, they're not terribly localized, uh, and as they're not ultra rich, these bears are spread out. You can see them, but you hardly see any interaction between the bears. Uh, most of the interaction that I actually saw was like wolves running up to bears and trying to tease them and trying to get the bears to chase them. So wolves seem to make a game out of teasing bears. But after two or three years in interior of Alaska, I decided to go to the coast. And the reason for that was simply much higher concentration of bears. And that is because of the food sources on the coast. Like in this picture, it might be hard to see, but there are 35 bears in there, mostly sows with cups and juveniles, but also some adult males. And actually on that particular day, I counted 72 bears on half a mile of river. And the reason for the bears to be there is fish, salmon. And the salmon might be there for a few weeks. They could be there for a few months. It depends on whether it's just one fish run. It depends on the species of the salmon, how long they're running. And as long as there's fish, there will be bears around. And the bears will be, be feeding for several hours and then they, on fish. And then they may feed, feed on something else, like here on, uh, on crab apples. And bears are generally just very, very visible. And my most of the feeding will be around fish, and they will gorge themselves on fish. So these bears, you, they may eat as many as 50 fish a day, but uh, their stomach actually can't utilize that food. Uh, so they focus then on the choice bits of the fish, and which in, in salmon, that's the skin, all the fat and fishes underneath the skin and in the brain. And they leave the rest if they have a choice. Like this big male, as you can see, all the fish below his body, all the skin has been ripped off the fish. The bear has eaten that. They will, they, he will have eaten the brain and it leaves the rest behind. Uh, that doesn't mean the rest is spoiled. There will be other bears, juvenile bears that will eat on, on the meat. Uh, there might be sows of cups getting that or cups that are on their own. They may get some of that. It's similar to like polar bears when you hear about a male polar bear when he kills a seal, he will eat only the blubber. And then there might be another bear that had no luck hunting that will eat the rest. So if having all this food also you have very, very high productivity. So there's actually females sometimes with four cups. There's even been females with five cups observed, like in the interior where there is much less food around. Three cups is the most, and often you only see two cups with the sow. But here, there every so often you have a sow four, and this particular one actually had four cups three times in a row. And she was so successful, she was able to raise all of them to adulthood. Like cup survival generally is only about half of the cups that are born make it to adulthood. But she was such a good mother, she succeeded in get, getting them all through adulthood. And to be successful is a matter of choice. Like for the female, she has to be aggressive enough, defend her food source against competition. That can be like, it can be a wolf trying to get fish from her, or here's an eagle that was trying to uh, scoop up a fish. Like there's foxes around, there's wolverine around, all that. She has to defend her food sources against competition. Sometimes that involves another bear. Uh, in most cases, these fights among bears are rare as there is so much food. In this particular instance, we had one year where there was a fish run failure and the bears are fighting all the time. And the only females that got their cups through were the ones that were able to defend their fish against another bear. And it's also selection of where you fish, like um, not the entire river has good fishing conditions. If the water is too deep, the fish get away. Uh, best places are these kind of little waterfalls because the fish get stacked up below the falls and then it's easy for the bears to fish. But then the biggest bears, which means the big males, they have the choice of place. And the females, like the Sauber Cups in the front, she's very, very careful not to encroach too tightly among on, onto these big males as it might be dangerous for her. And uh, like even 
you always, well, you probably all of you have heard that sows can be very, very defensive of their cups and may attack anything. Well, she still has to be careful who she attacks. Like a big male may also kill her if she attacks them. So they, they, she has to make a choice which bear she is aggressive to, which bear she avoids, which bear she defends a food source against. Like this sow is, is charging uh, a medium-sized male, not a full-grown male. So there's a lot of interesting behavior you can watch then if you have high concentration. You can see play action, like fights generally are not very common because every fight also carries the risk of injury, even for a large male. So bears try to avoid fights, but you see play action. Then what I was able to observe there, and a lot of my research were, went into that, is also mating activity. This here is a large male following a female. And uh, as the large males are often grumpy, they're much bigger than the females, twice the size, she is generally quite shy of them. And so this male actually has to convince the female that his intentions are, are good and uh, that he's not a threat to her. And it often takes days of him following her around until she finally lets him come in. And then he shows like there's so many humans, it's like I'm showing off. So this male is trying to show off I'm big. He puts out his chest, he rubs his back just to show how big he is. This is dominance behavior towards other males. So, so this is my female. This is the the one that uh, I will be mating with. So stay away. Though so This is what this guy is doing. I was able to observe a lot of maternal care in these bears. Then I started to, to also photograph them underwater. In those days, it was still film, so underwater wasn't easy. But I wanted to know how these bears actually fish underwater. How do they get to fish? How are they selecting their prey? And I started to follow bears into the fall uh, until I started doing it. I was always told that bears in the fall get really dangerous because they're desperate to get enough food in as there's hibernation coming up. So it's highly dangerous to spend time with the bears as they're so aggressive. I found they're not aggressive at all. They're so focused on food, they're not caring about anything else. But the biggest problem was always weather. Weather then in coastal Alaska in the fall gets really nasty with big, big storms. And this is a bear that actually is fishing in a storm in the, in the waves. And then it gets pretty soon quite cold. Like I had temperatures as far as 30 below in the fall uh, without any snow on the ground yet, uh, just because daylight hours get low. And But the bears were still around. They, they were fat. They were happy. There was basically no aggression at all. I also discovered that these bears wouldn't go into hibernation because the snow starts falling. They go into hibernation if there's no food left. So snow and cold is not a problem for a bear. Food is a problem for a bear. So these grizzlies, they would stay out as long as there was food available. And so I would follow them until they basically went into their dens. And this is a female just before den entrance, and uh, you can see how fat she is. This is not an enhanced image. This is how she was. And bears, uh, females, before they go into the den, if they don't have cubs, they're often hyper obese because that's the only way how they can go through pregnancy. They spend up to six months in, in a den, and they have to nurse their cubs. They have to go through pregnancy and all of that. And when they come out of the den, they may weigh only half as much as when they went into the den. And this one had three cups the next spring. And the only problem you really have is bears that are injured for whatever reason, they can't feed properly. If you can see like on this bear, this is a big male. And uh, he basically was just skin and bones. He had a big injury on the hip. He got into a fight with another, with another male over a moose carcass and couldn't feed for over a month. And these are the bears that are then your potential problem. If you see a bear that is well fed, that's not a problem bear. These skinny ones are the problem bears uh, because they're desperate, and desperate bears may do desperate things. But what I learned over all my years there on the coast is how to interact with bears, how to read their behavior. Like here, a family coming at you doesn't mean they're aggressive. Like look at the ears, ears are pointed towards you. That's not an aggressive bear. He's just 
family is just walking down the beach because of walking down the beach and I'm sitting there, so they come by me. And uh, neither is this one is, is an aggressive animal. It may appear to you like to be like d directing like aggression or threatening towards you, but she's just relaxing. She's just sitting there. It's a female we called Chow Mein, was always one of my favorite bears that would hang around me a lot. If you see aggression, you also always see the ears far back. Like look at the bear on the right, how the ears are back. So this is the female being aggressive towards that one young male. And you can tell that they're aggressive. But, and you're the same. You can see how the ears are all the way back. Uh, you can read the bears. You, you know what they're going to do, whether they're going to be aggressive toward you. But aggression doesn't mean that they're going to maul you. Uh, it basically is a warning. Like in all these aggression that you've seen there, there wasn't a single physical contact between the bears. They just warned each other, and then they walked off. So I worked in for about 10 years with grizzlies intensely, and then I was offered to go up north to work with polar bears. And for me, with polar bears, it was highly interesting. Uh, until then, I hadn't worked there much because of access. It was just so difficult to get up both logistically, very, very expensive. And uh, But then the opportunity arose. Based on my grizzly work, they wanted me just to assess polar bear interpreted for people and I was invited to come up to Hudson Bay and watch these bears there and give my assessment of bear behavior and for me the the interesting part was well to what degree are polar bears just totally different to brown bears to what degree are they the same uh, like you look at them physically they're they are quite different like they can still interbreed. Polar bears and, and grizzlies can interbreed and they do occasionally. Uh, but physically you can see there's a clear difference. Uh, they're more pear shaped. You see the hip is quite a bit, like they have this long uh, neck. Um, and this is all for swimming. Polar bears are called Ursus maritimus, scientifically, the water bear. They're they love the water, they swim a lot, and this adaptation is for swimming. A long neck allows them to keep the head above water more easily, breathe more easily when they're swimming. The pear-shaped body makes them glide through the water easier. Uh, they also then behaviorally swim differently, like the bear on the right bottom, you see. This is a female that broke through the ice and she spread out her back legs to spread out her weight and then only propels herself with the front leg to get back on solid ice. When they're swimming, they do the same thing. They actually spread out their back legs and only paddle with their big front feet that are like, well, can be up the size of a dinner plate and, uh, and swim very, very effectively, very fast that way. A brown bear swims like a dog with all four legs. When you look at uh, the nose of a bear, of a polar bear, you see this is it's straight like a, a brown bear. The nose is dish shaped, it's dished in, and the reason that it's straight in a polar bear is that it has an enlarged nasal cavity, and that's to warm up the the air they're inhaling and cool it down when they're exhaling, which helps them with water retention. So they have to drink much less than if you like us. If we go to the Arctic. And it's 40 below, we have to drink a gallon of water just to replenish the water that we lose through breathing. A polar bear basically doesn't have to drink in the winter. They don't lose any water through exhaling and uh, through the nose. And as they eat mostly fat, they get water back that way. Um, so if you look at the feet, the feet are quite different from a brown bear, uh, much more furry. They actually have a little suction cup on the sole of their feet. It helps them not to slip on the ice. And if you take a look, you see how curled their, their claws are. Like grizzly claws are much, much longer. They're more big for digging here. The curled short claws of a polar bear is it helps them to get a grip on the ice. And they're huge and white their feet, uh, wide their feet. And that... One thing, it helps them to spread out the weight on thin ice, but the other thing is swimming. A polar bear can swim uh, five miles an hour for hours on end. Like if you're in a kayak or a canoe, you would be hard pushed to stay ahead of that bear if he was following you in the water. 
they and they do that for hours and days. Polar bears have been seen swimming offshore a hundred miles from the nearest land or ice, totally unstressed. They are true water bears. Then there's other behavior that uh, I found curious that I haven't really thought about when I watched brown bears do the same thing. I saw brown bears lying down spread eagle on wet sand. I just thought, oh, they're just getting comfortable. But with polar bears, then I realized this has nothing to do with getting comfortably physically. This is to cool off. We think of polar bears living in the Arctic in winter and 40 belows of getting chilled. Well, that's a very human attitude as we as a species evolved in subtropical climate. A polar bear doesn't really get cold. They have much more problems of overheating. Like a healthy polar bear has up to several inches of fat on their whole body and it keeps them warm even in 40 below. And the biggest problem is if they move a lot, like this bear was playing with another bear, they overheat very easily, even in 20, 30 below. And the only place where they can get rid of excess heat is their, their armpits and their leg pits. And so when a bear then lies out spread eagle like that, he's cooling off. He's trying to get cold. This is similar to us putting an ice pack in our neck. So other thing I learned then with polar bears is that you see way more playing interaction between adult polar bears than you see in brown bears. Uh, like. Adult male brown bears are basically solitary animals. They don't spend much time with other adult male brown bears. But polar bears, if there's food around, you may have 20, 30 males hanging out together, socializing, playing with each other. And sometimes these play actions can even include animals of another species, like with these dogs. And there was no aggression of the polar bears towards the dog, but I could never figure out how the dog would ever be enticed to play with these polar bears in any way as much as 10 times as much as this, this poor dog. But uh, there basically has never been any aggression between them. So after a few years of mostly working uh, off vehicles, mostly like these tundra buggies to observe bears, I realized that I wouldn't see a lot of the way of behavior I wanted to see. And I was able to go to cabins that were into other areas were a little bit further away from the shore, like right on the shore doing freeze up in, in areas like Churchill. Basically all the bears you see are either juveniles or big males. You hardly ever see families. And I wanted to see more social interaction, I wanted to see bears do other things. And so I was able to go to some of these cabins and there were then sows of cups hanging around. Uh, basically, I was asked to go out there to make sure the bears don't break into the cabins and to keep the bears away. And uh, so this is a sow then defending her cups against one male that also came around. They would, was able to see these interactions. Here again, you see the aggression, the, the ears are back. And I was very interested when you watch then these females, when they feel threatened, they behave quite differently to brown bears or black bears. If brown bears and black bears get into a confrontation with another bear, like a female of cubs, the cubs will run off. In a black bear, the cubs will climb a tree and a grizzly, they just run away and hide somewhere. In a polar bear, the cubs will actually stay right with the mother. That's the only safe place for them. So if she charges, she charges with the cubs right at her side. And this is what you see in this picture. This is a female with two yielding cubs charging a, a male and uh, showing him off. And you can see how impressive is, that is if you have a whole family charging at you. And with my experience with brown bears, I could also see that a lot of the behavior that the uh, polar bears showed towards people was not at all aggressive. It was just curiosity. Like this bear, look, look at the ears. This is not a threatening bear, it's just a curious bear. And so slowly the idea started in me that potentially like what I've done with brown bears, where with brown bears I just walked among them, that maybe this was possible to do with polar bears as well, but I was still hesitant. Everyone told me if I walked, well, initially when I started working with grizzly, everyone told me working with grizzlies is, is suicidal, but showed it wasn't. But then when I came with polar bears, everyone told me, well, bears are totally different. You can't walk with them. That would be surely suicidal. And for, so for a number of years, I was very hesitant to ever walk with them. 
but I wanted to see more of their life. So uh, this was like the mid 1990s. And I uh, see like, what are they doing in the winter? And like, there's a denning area in Southern Hudson Bay uh, where polar bears then in the winter, uh, the, the females, the pregnant females will go into the den to have their young. And these denning areas are areas where the females are far enough away from other bears while they're in the den that they don't get bothered by them, but close enough to a prime feeding area in the spring when they come out of the den that they don't have to go hundreds of miles with their cubs. So the females will then in certain areas that meet these two criteria. You have to be close enough to a prime feeding area in the spring when they come out of the den, but far enough from possible disturbance by other bears. So they're usually a little bit inland. Well, in southern Hudson Bay, uh, what these den sites are in places, like this is the other side with the cups just after she came out of the den, these den sites are persistently the same sites they had years before. Like in all other areas, uh, polar bears will like den in a certain area, but you don't know exactly where the den site is. You may know it's in that valley, but you don't know where in that valley as the dens over the summer, as they're in the snow, will melt, collapse, and so the female has to dig a new den. And uh, so that makes it a bit difficult to predict where the female comes out of the den and observe them. Well, in southern Hudson Bay, uh, the denning area is in a wooded area. And early on, early in the fall, like the females go in about October into the den, there is hardly any snow. There might be dusting on the ground, but not enough to dig a den. So the dens are actually in the soil, and to stabilize the soil, they're underneath roots. And these dens persist for generations. Some den sites have been shown that they've been in continuous use for 300 years. And this allows us to actually know exactly where the bears are. And we can go in the fall and see at which den site there's a polar bear sitting next to it, and then we know this den site is occupied. We can chart it on a GPS, and then go there in the spring and check when she's coming out. And so if you're lucky, we have this situation. So this den has just opened. So the dens, females with cups come out of the den usually in late February, early March. And uh, they, when they open the den, as a rule, they will be still like a day, two, maybe three days around the den before they head out on the ice. And this one just opened. You see, there's a few tracks just below the den opening, and that was the female. There's another little set of tracks on the side, but that was probably a fox. It wasn't one of the cubs. The cubs wouldn't be that light-footed. Uh, so these cubs, you just have to imagine, they have been their entire life. They were, at this point, about three months old. They weigh about 20, 25 pounds. They were born in the den. The den is about the size of a bed and about as tall as a table, connected with a little tube to the outside world, but that is all blown in with snow, so you, they would have been in total darkness, no way to play around, and now they look out at the inside and see for the first time sun, they see wide open space, they feel actually the cold. Uh, outside it's often 30 below at this time of the year, whereas in the den it would, be, would have been around freezing. So it's it's quite an experience. And then when you think of it, it's like I always have to think they look out of the den and the first thing they see is some biologist sitting a few hundred yards away. And so the female then, because of all these changes, if uh, the den is reasonably undisturbed, there's not any, not too many people around or other wildlife around, she may come out of the den and then dig a little day den. This here is a day den that was just a hundred yards away from this den site and for the, the cups to acclimatize. And you see the claw marks on the walls. And she was in there for one night and just to keep the cups out of the weather, out of the wind, and then she would head on towards the ice to get out to hunt seals again. And so this is, for me, this is all amazing. Like you have, the sow has been, basically had not been eating for nine months. She will have been losing weight for nine months when she's lost half of her body weight, if not more. She has to go out to now the sea ice to hunt again, to gain weight back, and to be able to keep on nursing these cups 
So there is no choice of her of just staying at the den side and let the cubs grow further. So the cubs coming out of the den, never having walked a mile in their life, never having ever been in a space that was more than, uh, yeah, like a bed. And now all of a sudden they have to walk a hundred miles over terrain and 30 below. It's just, and they've never seen sunlight. They've never had these smells. It's uh, might be just a jarring experience. And it's also quite exhausting for the cubs. So the female will have to stop every hour or so to let the cubs rest. They nurse, they have to build up to strength again, and then she'll walk on. And always going in a quite a straight line to where the seal pupping areas are out on the skies. I mean, this is where polar bears feed mostly. Uh, polar bears are hunters out on the sea ice. If there is no sea ice, I need 5% of their food sources simply not available. So that's where they have to go. That's where she has to go to gain weight again. And the weight gain can be substantial. We had one female that we caught uh, one fall probably after she just lost cups. She only weighed 194 pounds. She was totally emaciated. When she was caught again six months later, she weighed 970 pounds. So she quintupled her weight just being able to hunt out on the sea ice. This is also this rich food source that is out in the Arctic Ocean, the marine mammals that the polar bears hunt, uh, is what allows them to be the largest land carnivore in the world. So mostly a female will have two cubs. If you see one, then usually there's another one hiding there somewhere. Uh, they have to stick right close to the mother to be safe. And then occasionally, you also have three cubs. And if you have three cubs, like uh, I said before, like in brown bears, you quite frequently have three cubs. And uh, even sometimes four or four have never been observed to my knowledge in polar bears. And even three, usually one of the three is the runt. And the runt is usually one that sits right on top of the female. And that runt very often doesn't survive. It just doesn't get enough food. And the reason, in my opinion, is that polar bears, in contrast to brown bears, have only four nipples. That means four active mammary glands. And if you have two cups, they are able to each get two a nurse on it. So when they're very young, four nipples is fine, as all three then have one full nipple to mammary gland to get enough milk out. But as they grow, their milk demand grows, and one nipple is not enough to sufficiently supply one cup. So the cups fight over the additional nipple. And if you're three, the one that is the timid or the most smallest always gets less milk and will always be smaller. And that is the runt then. And they're often like half the size of the other cups here. The runt is again on the mother's back. And the other two are about the same size and much more active. The runt often just, just nuzzles up to the mother and does very little else, shows very little activity, just not getting the same amount of food. Uh, early on when I worked in with sows of cups, again, I was warned that oh, these cups, the sows will be very aggressive. They aggressively defend their cups. Well, we found that the sows really don't want to have much to do with you. They just leave you alone. They, they, anything, any contact with humans might be a threat to the cubs. So they really just stay away from you. And the only sow that I ever had that didn't do that, that actually came right up to us is this one, this particular one. And uh, we were following her tracks on a snow machine. And we we're just hoping we would see on a diff distance and would see how many cups she had and all that and we were traveling along following her tracks all of a sudden we saw her coming right at us and we stopped the snow machine and she would walk right up to us then walk around us and then settle down among these bushes about 50 yards away from us and it was so unusual that we kind of looked where she came from and uh, there were two wolves behind her so she heard our snow machines walked right towards the snow machines and used us to keep protection from wolves. And like basically a sow with cups cannot defend her cups against uh, a pack of wolves. It's impossible to, the wolves will just snatch the cups. So for her, we were the protection and she knew it and came right up to us. 
Well, after some years spending in a denning area, I was also interested in what polar bears would do in the summer because I was always told basically in the summer they just come to land, they lie down and rest and wait until winter comes again. As I said, polar bears are uh, ice hunters. They hunt on the ice for their main food source, which is marine mammals. And if there is no ice around, they have basically no chance to catch the marine mammals. Uh, whales in the water, are seals, walrus, all of that, they can't really get in the open water. They have to ambush them along the ice edge. Uh, the best time of the year for hunting is the seal pupping time, when the seal pups are on the ice, can't really escape, and uh, that's when the polar bears gorge themselves. And the summer was always thought they wouldn't feed at all, they would just lie somewhere, which might be true for some of the polar bears, like the very fat ones, but there's juveniles that wouldn't be all that fat, there's sows of cups they can't afford not to eat at all. And the question was for me, what would they do? I would see these polar bears walking along the beaches, but I could never really follow them, what they were doing. And it was to me curious, uh, like how would they get any food? Like grizzlies, they would prey heavily on caribou and caribou calves particularly, like in the calving time of caribou, significant number of calves would fall prey to grizzlies. But by the time the polar bears come to land, the calves are too old, they cannot be pursued anymore. But what we've seen sometimes is like they go for eggs, uh, mostly the like the geese, etc., are long done with with having uh, chicks by the time the polar bears show up on land. But in some areas, uh, some bears show up early, some geese nest late. There will be some predation on that, but it, it never seemed enough, not reliable enough, to really be a major food source for the bears. Uh, they will try to get to like some walrus uh, or seals, but mostly the problem is that. Uh, the walrus escape into the water. An adult walrus is anyway too big for even the biggest polar bear to, to get to. There have been walrus walking into the ocean with a polar bear sitting on their back. I and mean, it's uh, they just can't stop them. But what they try to do is rush the, pol the walrus and hope that they can get some young. And so I started walking along the, the coastlines. Well, originally I used four wheelers and the problem that we had was that the polar bears would always run off. There was just no way of getting the polar bears to hang around if you were with vehicles. They would just all take off. And when it was curious to see when they take off, a polar bear would always go for the water. So they, they would not see like uh, protection hide, hiding behind trees or bushes along the shoreline. They would head out towards the open water. And so I learned pretty quickly, if I do it with four wheelers, I'm always going to see the south end of a northbound bear. And if I really wanted to see behavior, I had to walk with them. And this is what we started to do. And initially, again, I was told that this is absolutely impossible. But with my experience with brown bears, I learned that it was, like, it was very possible to walk with polar bears. Yeah. You have to stay dominant. You have to be able to to show dominance, but uh, that you have to, that you can work with them and that they will uh, show you respect if you show them respect. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to go to certain areas, watch polar bears in the summer, uh, like this particular area I was camping on with uh, bears and flowers, and there were mostly Arctic terns around. Like I discovered only after a week that I always had put my camp about a mile in the wrong spot, and the bears were always a mile away out of my sight. But uh, so I was photographing mostly Arctic terns for a while, and uh, but they would attack you, and they would attack anything coming by, including a polar bear. And then we had a big storm. And they blew down our tent, and when the storm was over, I spent my time repairing the tent, and I was repairing the tent. A polar bear walked by, <laughs> and I saw him walking by, and all of a sudden that bear turned around and walked about 100 yards back and was out of sight for about an hour. And because of rocks and flowers, I didn't really want to walk up to that bear, so we waited whether it would reappear, and he came back about, well, reappeared about an hour or so later and then walked off. So then we walked over to see what was there and there was a dead beluga washed up on the beach. And so this 
had a lot of conflicting thoughts on me. Like I knew with brown bears, if you have something like a large carcass there, you would get a lot of bears around, but you would get a lot of fighting. And here I was with a tent, just like 100 yards away from a dead beluga. And this, and there was nowhere we could go anywhere. There was no escape route. We were stuck on a little island in the, in the flowers. And uh, it was true, within two days, we had 27 polar bears right wow. around our camp. But none of them showed any aggression towards mm -hmm. us. Um, it was like Matthias, I, Matthias yeah. I'm really, really sorry to interrupt the story. I really am. But we're at the 42 minute mark, and I know our classes are literally going to be leaving to their next period in about three, four minutes. So okay. it, it's been fantastic. I mean, it's beyond amazing. These, these images, these stories, they are wild, literally and figuratively. Um, but if it is okay with you, I'd love to take just a few questions from some of our classes before we have to wrap up. I'm literally going straight from this into another broadcast. And so if it's good, if, if you wanted to wrap up the story, we can, but I, I'd like to make sure that we have some time for questions. That's good. Well, okay, I'm gonna do it very quickly. So like <laughs> we had basically no, no aggressive bears. This one was the only one that showed some aggression and he turned out was a fed bear. And so the, the shots from this resulted that I did then a, a movie for a TV documentary for Smithsonian on it, uh, which with this boat, it turned into quite, a, quite an ordeal logistically. The bears were fine. It was just so logistically hard to work in the Arctic because of weather conditions, storm conditions. And we would follow the bears all the way through from like spring to late fall until they go back out on the ice. We found them eating berries. We found them hunting belugas in the summer. We found them actually pursuing moose. So yes, they are primarily marine mammal hunters, but not entirely. I mean, there's other food sources. It's not like if there is no ice around that there's still polar bears. No, the polar bears depend on ice, but they do other things. And then since then, I've worked way more in the high Arctic. Uh, this is like up Svalbard. You see some small polar bears in front of the ice. Up on uh, the ice shelf, like the, being out on the pack ice, following bears around, following them like hunting belugas. Here's some belugas below the ice. There were polar bears sitting on these icebergs and jumping on top of beluga backs and getting some. They even done it with not all that we watched. So it was quite an eye opener and most of my work now is uh, trying to figure out what the bears do with in the changing climate. Where are they using the habitat? How are they using the habitat? And what does that mean for their future? So this is the quick end of it. So Jesse, if you have some questions. I'm sorry to do that. I know we could chat all day. This has been really, really fantastic. And again, one of our biggest programs we've ever had on Bear. So I certainly from the over 100 questions we've gotten on YouTube, I think you've sparked a lot of enthusiasm and interest, Matthias. Um, if we, uh, a few quick notes. I know some of our teachers are going to have to head out in a minute. I am going to try and take uh, one question from each of our live groups over the next few minutes. And I want to highlight for everyone at home too, you can check out Matthias's website, even more photographs, more stories uh, at the link I've just brought up below. So do check that out. And I will put that in the YouTube chat bar as well. What I want to do now is bring in Miss Michael's group. They're joining us in Glendue, Illinois. We'll do one round with all our live classes and wrap up from there. So Miss Michael, take us away. Okay, I have Dua who would like to ask a question. Dua, would you like to unmute yourself? So I don't know if you heard I, this. She's asking. Oh, go ahead. I, I didn't hear the question correctly. Ah, so. When do cubs start to learn to swim? Yeah. They basically know swimming as soon as they get to the, the sea ice. So when they're like they're in the den until they're about three months old, they get out to the sea ice within the next two, two three weeks. But hmm. early on, the biggest problem for cups is that they have fat on their body. So they get very quickly, very cold. So they often, like when they're very young and when it's still cold, they actually will more or less sit on their mother's back when she swims across leads. They can't swim, but they get hypothermic and they could die because of getting too cold. If that answers your question, like they, they, they swim right away, but the water is generally too cold for them to swim long distances. 
We had programs yesterday on otters as well, and it's really fascinating. Humans are one of those species that are really quite helpless for a very long period of time, but a great many, most species, in fact, have a lot of those skills sort of built in from birth. You, you may have seen in natural history documentaries, wildebeest being born and running within mere minutes of, of coming out. And it's quite fantastic to think about these sorts of things. So great question, guys. Um, let's head to our Tribune Trailblazers with Macintosh's group. Come on in and uh, go for it. Hey there, we've got a question from Deanna. Deanna, do you want to go ahead? How much do bears eat? So a bear, well, if they can eat, they can certainly eat 50 pounds to 100 pounds a day, depending on how big is the bear, um, how old is the bear, like cups, obviously much less. Generally, a polar bear to gain weight has to catch a seal every three days. And a seal is about like a ringed seal, 70, 80 pounds of food for them. So they have to eat that every three days just to gain weight. A sow with cubs, even more often. So uh, that also means like for most of the year, a polar bear will actually lose weight because they can't catch every three days another seal. Uh, but there is the seal pupping time when they basically eat all day long, and that's when they gain weight. They may gain weight within a month. They may double their weight within two months. Uh, so this is also why polar bear survival is a, is a tricky question. Sea ice is only one part of the equation. It's also how much food there is. So if there is sea ice when there is seal pupping time, the polar bears will do fine because uh, they can get enough weight to basically make it for several months without ice uh, if the time of feeding is really good. I wanted to bring up, I'm just putting up her name in a banner for you guys. Alisa McCall is a polar bear researcher. We featured many times on the broadcast. If you want to learn about some of the more uh, sort of cutting edge science on polar bears, what's going on with their populations, do check out her broadcast. They're awesome. And for all our kids, if you want to see some footage of polar bears hunting the most amazing things, uh, the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, has put out some really incredible documentaries the last few years, hunting things in Canada, hunting beluga whales and pulling them out of the water. It's really quite marvelous to see. So hopefully a nice follow-up for that question. All right, let's head to Mr. Mark Rick's class joining us in Sudbury. Uh, come on in, guys. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. One of my students, Kristen, is an aspiring photographer, and I'm, she was wondering if you have any advice for her. Well, the, the biggest advice is always really focus on a specific subject matter. Um, so a lot of the things that I've been able to take is because I spent so much time with the bears. And you get to know them, you get to know their life cycles, you get to know, you, you get to read them. And so intense knowledge of your subject matter is hugely important. And uh, then focus on that for your work. Uh, the more general, the more broad you are, the more difficult it gets to actually bring a story across, find people interested in your work. And I think your quality overall suffers because you just simply don't know the subject matter as well. That is a very uh, tangible piece of advice. We, we picked up that question a lot from our speakers in the past, so I really appreciate that. I think uh, the delightfully named Susan Funkenhauser on YouTube uh, sums it up best uh, about how great the presentation was and great photos and, and stories. So uh, thank you, Mr. Margaret, for that, that question. Let's go to Ms. Olson's class. They're joining us in Rochester, in Minnesota. If you guys want to unmute your microphone, and come on in. I think your devices might be on. Let's see together. If not, we'll head to our third grade folks. There we go. Hi, Ms. Oslas. Unmute your mic, and then you're all set. So, Hi. We were wondering how, if you ever get um, nervous when you're out there by the bears, or like what you do to protect yourself. So with polar bears, um, I always have a shotgun along. I never had to use it, but I have it along. Um, what I generally have along is a marine flare and some cracker shells. And in all my life, I had to use it once. And that was food related. I had to chase a bear away that got into food and was breaking into buildings. So out walking with the bears, I never had to use any of it. 
Um, it's safety is hugely in numbers. So uh, I always like to have at least one more person with me, preferably two or three. Um, and the bears show respect as soon as you have a couple of people with you. If you're on your own, they get just feel more in control and get pushier. Uh, and a lot of it is just you also select the bear you work with. Like I know with seconds of first encountering the bear, whether that bear is going to be potentially problematic or whether that bear will be just fine. You can tell from his behavior. Um, that's when a bear that comes towards you and you do one little step towards the bear, if the bear just hesitates or goes a little bit to the side, no, there's, there's never going to be a problem. So the nervousness is uh, the first few seconds when you encounter the bear. It's like with people. 99.9% .9 of the people are good, but you never know whether you're going to run into that one rot rotten apple. Uh, but you know within seconds whether this could be one of the rotten apples. I think this speaks to your experience and your dedication to building up this knowledge base. Uh, it's a question we got on YouTube as well, and then sort of speaks to Mr. Margaret's student question about photography. I mean, you know so much about these bears, and you highlighted that so beautifully throughout the presentation. So, uh, a great question, guys. Uh, as our, our penultimate one, I want to head now to, to Holbrook in New York, our third grade Merrimack group. Uh, come on in, Miss Peters, and, and wrap it up. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. How, how do you determine the difference? the difference between a female and a male. How do you determine the difference between a female and a male? So when they're adult, an adult male is easy to tell apart. It's like uh, generally uh, if you take an adult human, uh, a male and a man and woman are easy to tell apart. Uh, there's just physical characteristics like a, a male is considerably larger, they have much wider heads. Uh, there is no mistaking. I mean, uh, I would have to show you now a, a male, adult male, and adult female next to each other, and you would see right away. Uh, they're much more massive, uh, double the size, uh, there's no question. Uh, the only problem is when they are like three, four years old. Uh, three, four year old bears, male and female, unless they pee, you basically can't tell. As soon as they get older, the, the males get lankier because they grow taller in height uh, than, than the females. Um, if you see a real lanky bear that is quite tall, it's always a young male. Uh, then females, like after they're four or so, they get more round. Um, so there's distinct physical difference. But that age group, three-year-old, four-year-old, is unless they pee, you, you're just guessing. You don't know. Fantastic questions, guys. I, I, again, I would like to have the chance or more, but do check out Matthias's fantastic website. You can check out more board, bear programs at exploringbytheseat.com and our YouTube channel, of course. And Matthias, thank you so much for sharing your passion, your enthusiasm, and, and such amazing stories with us today. Truly, it doesn't really think, I don't think anyone has had this many interactions with wild bears in such a fantastic way in their life. And, and so it's a real privilege to get a chance to chat with you. Excellent, guys. Uh, what we're going to do now is what we do at the end of every broadcast. Matthias is new to our, our, our program, but I'm going to bring in all our teachers today. So, Ms. Michael, Ms. McIntosh, Mr. Hey. Pisco, and Ms. Peters, join me in saying a big thank you.